um, g given this situation, when we talk about uh, topological quantum matter, it's, it's important to notice that there are a few organizing uh, principles that help us to discriminate between different types um, of uh, topological matter. And actually, uh, this will be blackboard. You don't have to copy. I, I, I will distribute PDF in some way. If you can read my handwriting, you're good. Um, yeah, that's a challenge. Uh, <laughs> so, topological matter. I mean, um, if we talk about it, um, we have to make a, f uh, a few um, decisions. And, um, yeah, that's better. So, first of all, there is one axis uh, symbolically representing the strength of interparticle interactions. So, we have to decide um, whether um, we want to talk <coughs> about. Um, something that is strongly interacting. Can you read this? Yeah. Um, in the sense that we have strong interaction generated entanglement and so on, or whether we are operating in a sector where interactions are relatively modest, such that we have a chance to get away with some effectively non-interacting Landau quasi-particleish um, theories, right? Um, then there is another dimension. Um, where we have to decide whether we actually want to talk about gapless quantum matter, matter where we have soft excitations, um, gap uh, less. Um, and at this point, this tends to be the more complicated part of the axis, as opposed um, to effectively inert or insulating um, quantum matter where we have excitation gaps present. Yeah? And finally, um, we have to tell whether our uh, matter which we're interested in is fundamentally bosonic in the sense that it builds on uh, bosonic fundamental quantum uh, particles on the basic level or um, fermionic. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's um, the kind of uh, decisions we have to make and what I would like to um, cover in some sense in this um, uh, talk is this relatively modest octant sitting down here. Um, weakly interacting fermionic gap quantum matter, <coughs> which is, in a sense, the simplest of um, all, I mean, the other seven are a bit less understood at this point, but nevertheless, it's important, um, and in particular, it accommodates uh, the physics of topological insulators and superconductors, which is of some importance to this school. Now, having been so modest, I mean, uh, we can also say that what, what we are going to discuss um, tolerates, to, to a fair extent, reasonably strong interactions and we can also go a bit in the gapless direction. I mean, by semi-metal is a keyword we have heard. But basically, we will um, operate here. But within this framework here, within this sector, I want to be really general and not make too many specializing assumptions, etc. Yeah? Uh, what about disorder? So we oh, that, that is, this is very disorder. Yeah. Um, disorder is my, I love disorder. So dif disorder <laughs> is, uh, we, we will de definitely tolerate disorder. Um, Ah, and thank you. I mean, basically, always interrupt me. I try to be ultra clear. If I fail, immediately interrupt. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Another question. Um, okay. For for a theory where it's um, not a limited device, mm -hmm. um, does it make a difference if I use a bosonic or a theory? Na ja. To some extent, you have a Fermi surface, no? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I in, in what I want, uh, I, I, I like some Fermi surfaces in what. But we, we can, you have a point. I mean, not really. No. Fair, fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, given this uh, setting, um, let's now consider a system. I was, I was too pretentious. I'm not that tall. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, what I would like to focus on now is um, actually topology ultimately, but we will see topology is, is strongly linked to symmetry. I mean, these two are twin brothers in this context, the so symmetry and topology um, uh, of um, this um, sector here. And um, to this end, um, let's uh, uh, consider the following setting. So this is now uh, symbolically the type of systems we want to consider. Imagine um, a generally finite size system, your favorite piece of topological insulator, whatever. And um, before we get going and discuss what symmetry and topology mean for such systems, it is um, 
it is well to introduce a number of um, length scales and correspondingly energy scales, which will then organize our discussion later on. Yeah? So um, length scales, um, there is a macroscopic scale, which is set by the extension of the system we, we look at. And uh, then there is the ultimate extreme. Um, say we have some, um, or actually it's even smaller. We can zoom in here on, on deep microscopic scales, and then we will notice that there are some quantum particles uh, moving here, and they have typic typically a de Broglie wavelength, lambda, that, that sets the ultraviolet scale in the game. And then um, we will also tolerate, uh, here it comes, that there is some junk in the system. So there can be some kind of scattering going on, and um, uh, that def can be characterized loosely by some elastic mean free path, which sets the st uh, length scale associated to some imperfections. Yeah? So these are roughly um, the length scales we have. And um, then again, I mean, we, we assume that our quantum particles here are in a sense, weakly interacting, um, but we tolerate translational invariance breaking. So this is our system. And now, um, hmm, now, now I need, perhaps I can do this here. Um, uh, now, in, in, in a very schematic way, I want now um, to, um, yeah? No, it's uh, what I mean by that is um, the the Broly wavelength corresponding to a fictitious particle moving at the Fermi surface. So I haven't yet talked about a gap, but you're absolutely right. The gap is an important energy scale in gap quantum matter, which we have to consider. Definitely, I wanted to just make it, it's just our ultra ultraviolet scale. Okay. Hmm. Right. Um, so uh, we can now, um, I mean, very schematically. Um, introduce here an axis where we uh, order our length scales according to size, lambda L, and here there will be um, the system size, and correspondingly, um, relatedly, uh, we have um, energy scales which are associated to these. So um, the energy scale corresponding to um, lambda is sort of the Fermi energy. Um, here we have something like the inverse of a scattering time corresponding to a mean free path. And um, here it gets more interesting. Um, the energy scale relating to the actual system size depends now on whether um, you're dealing with a clean case, in which case this is irrelevant, or whether you're dealing with a translational invariance breaking system, which is strongly disordered. And um, in the uh, clean case, um, the natural energy scale corresponding to the uh, system size is, is Fermi velocity over system size. That is the ballistic time of flight a quantum quasiparticle will take a quasiparticle at the Fermi surface to rush one through. Yeah. That, I mean, the inverse of that sets an energy scale, um, which is the energy scale a particle needs to actually find out to discover that it's living in a finite size system. And in the disordered case, which I also want to cover, um, this will be um, the uh, diffusion constant, which is material constant relating to the amount of dirt we have, divided by um, L squared. That is the inverse of the time a particle in a disordered medium needs to diffuse around and ultimately discover, hey, I'm confined in a finite size system. Yeah. To is that clear? I mean, so this is like um, an um, energy scale according to Heisenberg and principle, uh, principle associated to that time scale. Yep. Can you read what D is? D is the diffusion constant. Diffusion. Yeah. Um, if you look into the notes, um, which I distribute, this is actually written. I'm right now. I'm just saying it. But don't have it. Okay. So why why I'm bringing this up? Because um, depending on where we are and what kind of phenomena we are interested in, whether we're interested in ultraviolet physics or ultra low energy physics, different physical principles matter. Yeah. And very roughly, we can say that um, up to, say, here, um, we really have to worry if we want to know something, understand something on an on a atomistic level, um, ultraviolet physics, band structure stuff, we, we, are really, we should be worried about microscopic details. 
I mean, we really have to look into basic um, microscopic structures. Yep. And just symbolically, <laughs> nothing. Um, <laughs> it's just, I, I just, here I will draw now a number of things you have to consider if you are interested in this. And all I want to say here, there is no access, is um, that if you want to do physics here, then you better address microscopic stuff. Okay, right? Um, beginning as of uh, somewhere here, the dimensionality of your system begins to play a role. Um, this is dimensionality. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, all systems are ultimately three-dimensional, yeah? But if you look at something like, say, um, a semiconductor heterostructure or something which is very flat and very wide, yeah? Then at some point, excitations and transverse direction will be frozen out and the system will behave effectively two-dimensional, yeah? And um, this doesn't happen down here, but it happens at some moderate energy scale. So this is where dimensionality kicks in and we have to discriminate between effectively one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and if you are theoreticians, you can go to eight-dimensional. Um, now, about um, at a sli slightly larger scale, very weak, yeah? Here, fundamental symmetries will begin to play a role, and um, I will spend a great deal of time on explaining what I mean by symmetry. So, wait a second, if you... Um, if we want, and I owe you an explanation of what's going on here. And finally, at the largest scales, I mean, we heard that this morning, I mean, if you really explore the system as a whole and you are sensitive to its global structure, including its topological nature, um, then um, you uh, should also think about topology. And it's an important disclaimer, yeah? You could also say, say, I have some um, skirmion material. We have some topological defects around or some vortex matter. This is not the type of topology I want to address in these talks. But it's rather the topology of the system at large. <coughs> in, in a sense. Okay, so um, that's basically very roughly the setting. And um, I will now spend quite some time on introducing and discussing symmetries as a really important organizing principle for all that follows. And then we will draw the connection to uh, topology. And actually, I thought I have three times 90 minutes, but I learned I have only three times 60 minutes, and it doesn't matter. I can stop any time after a certain cutoff which I want to reach, and I will reach, yeah? So, um, but, I mean, these two I definitely want to introduce. And now I need more space. Okay. So, um, let's start discussing symmetries. You can forget all I said so far. Um, and... Um, Symmetries in quantum mechanics in the most general terms. <coughs> uh, so, symmetries. Um, in, um, the beginning of this will be known to pretty, pretty much everybody. I just introduced it to introduce some notation, but then it may get a little bit less familiar. Um, so, what do we need to fix the symmetry? We need a certain amount of data, yeah? I mean, um, first of all, to talk about symmetries in quantum mechanics, we better have a Hilbert space. Um, and I call my Hilbert space H, and for convenience, I will assume it to be finite dimensional. It doesn't matter much. But, um, um, in my Hilbert space, I have um, states, psi, also need. Um, we then need a symmetry group. Symmetry group. Oops, group. And um, on an abstract level, this is a group um, G, where you can be abstract. And in this group live abstract elements um, small g. And um, we will make them then more concrete when we discuss how they act on state psi. And finally, if we actually want to discriminate, I mean, is the system symmetric, yes or no, then we need to talk about the Hamiltonian. I mean, how it behaves on a, so we also need a Hamiltonian. Um, eight, okay. Now, um, these abstract guys are now represented in concrete terms via their action on states, yeah? And that's um, what we 
What you need, so the symmetry group, or I can call it G, is uh, represented by a linear representation that, um, um, on H um, through transformation. Um, psi um, maps to for example, um, our abstract group could be Z2, right? two elements, plus and minus one binary group, and this could be a space reflection. I mean, a representation of this group where it acts by reflection or doesn't act at all, some, something like that. And um, it now turns out that um, many symmetries um, in quantum mechanics um, is of a unitary. In the sense um, that this map, which I associate to an element of G, is a unitary map in the sense of quantum mechanics in, 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 in Hilbert space. Yeah? And um, these such unitaries include, I mean, say, translations, um, rotations, um, crystal point groups, point groups. Um, in, and several others more. Now, a few years ago, 2010-ish or so, I would have claimed these unitary symmetries when it comes to topology don't matter too much. can essentially forget about them. But since 2010 and 11, uh, there has been the advent of crystalline topological quantum matter, and we will hear a lot more about that later on. So I'm uh, rather more modest now. And I mean, unitary symmetries are definitely of importance for our story here. Not so much the story I want to tell you, but uh, certainly about what Titus has to say um, later on and others. Um, but at any rate, they have to be seen in connection to their twin partners, the anti-unitaries. So there exist um, also anti-unitary symmetries. <coughs> um, others are anti-unitary. Now let me... Um, just remind you um, uh, what an um, anti-unitary map is. Before doing that, uh, just notation. Um, in the context of these lectures, when we talk about anti-unitary symmetries, um, I will represent them always by the symbol theta. It's just notation, yeah? My anti-unitaries are always called theta, and I, I describe to you later how they act. Um, just a reminder. reminder. What is an anti-unit? Or do you all know anti-unitary? Should I repeat? Yeah, I see some people not. Okay, um, a map theta acting in a, in a Hilbert space like this one is anti-unitary. Anti, um, sorry, if um, the following holds. Um, we have a few um, conditions. See, um, it's all about unitarity in a sense. So remember how you fix the unitary um, operation. You, you take an Hilbert space state, act on it with some transformation, um, and um, then take the scalar product overlap with another state, same transformation acting. And if it was unitary, they would cancel out, and this would be equal to the original scalar product, and an anti-unitary does um, almost that, except that there is a complex conjugation. Yeah, that's the definition. And um, this is then, by virtue of the um, definition of the complex scalar product, equal to the scalar product in reverse order. So that's an anti-unitary. <coughs> um, there is a second um, uh, criterion, which is, or actually it's implied by this, but um, um, an anti-unitary, oops, um, an anti-unitary, but is a consequence of this, if it acts on a state multiplied by a complex number, um, you can pull out uh, the complex number, but you have to pay with the complex conjugate for that. 
so you have this. And um, Z, is, yeah, Z is complex. Um, another important point, <coughs> you can always think of an anti-unitary as complex conjugation times something unitary. It's also important. So there exists a unitary map, and we are in an n-dimensional space here, so it's a UN transformation with the property that um, the anti-unitary is the unitary times k, and k is my symbol for complex conjugation. So it's just complex conjugates, nothing more. Um, that is all math. Now comes one important point from physics, um, and that's a f an axiom, actually. It means essentially what I'm using here, that uh, twice time reversal acting on an operator reproduces the operator. Um, and the consequence is that if I um, act twice with an anti physically meaningful anti-unitary, I get either um, the unit map or the negative of the unit map. That is, um, I mean, it's physics, um, physics condition. And um, in, in practice, when we work actually with, with topological insulators and so on, um, Usually, I mean, often we have a situation where in the former case, where theta uh, squares to unity, we can find a simple representation where theta is just complex conjugation, right? If you twice complex conjugate, you get unity. In the other case, um, it is um, often um, <coughs> or usually possible to... No, I times minus I to reduce a theta to complex conjugation times a simple 2 by 2, which has a property that if you build the square of this, you can do it, you, you, you square to minus 1. I mean, these are just convenient representations. I'm just showing them because you see them very often in papers um, in practice. Now, examples um, of this um, include uh, the usual suspects. Time reversal is anti-unitary. Um, particle hole, um, hole, charge conjugation. Um, etc. And if you are a bit at a loss as what I mean by that, um, that shows good taste. Because there, there is, I think there is only a few situations in physics where widespread and global notation is so confusing as in this business. Yeah? You can do the experiment. I mean, maybe you have already observed it. Take a crowd of physicists and ask them what you, I mean, little n of them, and ask them what they mean by particle hole symmetry. And chances are you get n different answers. And everybody is, of course, right. Um, so there is this um, ultra high level of confusion. And I I'm myself I tend to be very confused. And um, But I, I, I will want to share with you my, my current understanding of the situation, and maybe it helps a little bit um, to actually discriminate, say, between particle hole and charge conjugation and so on in concrete settings. But be aware, I mean, it's, it's, it's normal to be confused um, about this. Um, okay, so, question up to this point? Yeah? I mean, what you, very good. Um, what you require is that if you take a quantum mechanical operator and you, you, you um, I mean, on, on an operator, this operator acts in an adjoint, so it acts like theta, theta, and, <coughs> and if you apply twice, um, the operator should reproduce. That's the condition you impose. And um, if you then ask yourself, I mean, this still leaves you room. I mean, theta can be square to one or minus one. And, um, if you then dig a little bit further into the matter, then you realize that it's um, either plus or minus one. These are the two options that are realized. Yeah? Yeah. <coughs> and um, yeah, the rule of thumb is that uh, spin one half uh, systems have minus one and uh, spin one have plus one, but not always. <laughs> yeah. Okay. More questions, maybe? So now comes um, a an, an very important point um, for um, uh, our story here. 
see, when you talk about unitaries, it's clear that there is an infinite multitude <laughs> of different unitary symmetries. You can, not infinite, but lots of them. You can discriminate. Um, with the anti-unitaries, it's like there is only 10 different cases, uh, 10 different symmetry classes in the sense that you give me your favorite quantum system. I um, identify its irreducible representations. I, I'd be telling a little more about what I mean by that, but really the sectors in which the Hamiltonian is fundamentally represented. And then I can put a sticker on, on each of these. And uh, the sticker has labels in it. I mean, it goes from 1 to 10 in a certain notation we introduce. And it identifies precisely the type of anti-unitary symmetries that are realized. Yeah? <laughs> and and that's, that's, that will be an important part of our story. And um, let me explain how it comes about. Um, so there are 10 um, fundamental anti-unitary symmetry classes. And um, they are, in a way, the important, important part, um, together with physical dimension, they are actually the um, essential part um, that, or part of the story that uh, leads to classification of topological insulators and superconductors. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, <coughs> there are 10 symmetry classes, anti-unitaries. And um, what I present to you now is uh, an, a cheap and nutshell way of introducing them. So this is nutshell. Um, but nutshell also means um, that it's not very physical. And uh, in the second part of the story, I will then explain a little mo bit more how it really connects um, to real physics. But so far, um, we are a bit formal and simple. And we just define the following. Um, a system is time reversal invariant. Um, ah, I switch to this way of writing. Is this a good idea? Let me just try. Uh, invariant. If the following, that's the definition now. If there exists an anti-unitary, therefore theta, some anti-unitary symmetry, let's call it theta t, um, such that um, theta t um, stabilizes um, the Hamiltonian in this sense, yeah? When we call it, I mean, if we find an anti-unitary symmetry, no matter what, and it does this with the Hamiltonian, we call the system time reversal invariant. And um, we now have um, the three possibilities. <coughs> And that leads to a table, and ah, yeah, that's actually very smart. I do my tables here. Um, we can write down a little table listing the different options we have. Um, um, here are three possibilities. Ah, yeah, there, maybe there. So jump from there to here, yeah, here comes the table. Um, we can ask ourselves, is the symmetry pr present, yes or no? And um, on top of that, if it is present, we can ask ourselves, are we dealing with a guy that squares to one or minus one? These are the, the two options we have here. Yeah? And um, if the symmetry is not present, then we just don't care what it does. Yeah. And let me call this, this is the label, um, let me call this T0, no time without the symmetry. If the symmetry is present and theta t squares to plus 1, I call this t1. Yeah, that's one option. And if the symmetry is present and t, uh, theta squares to minus 1, I call this t minus 1. And I can categorize all Hamiltonians according to one of the three. Okay. So that was um, one step. Um, now, I, I just mentioned it. Um, uh, there is um, systems which have um, this here are usually spin one half systems, but there are um, counter examples to that. Um, do you want to see a counter example? I just tell it. Um, if you ask me if you, uh, Dirac fermions, two dimensions, scalar potential. 
um, has the property that it, um, you can come up with such an anti-unitary, it squares to minus one, but there is just no spin, spin inside. I mean, spin doesn't matter, spin is particles. It's too big. So be aware, in textbooks you find this that always theta squared minus one is spin one half. It's not always the case. Um, good. So that was it. Uh, then comes another definition. Um, a system is charge conjugation symmetric. Conjugation um, or invariant. If we can find an anti-unitary, it does see, 